One of the busiest pillars known from Gobekli Tepe is Pillar 43 in Building D. With its enigmatic so-called baskets or handbags across the top, several animals, and one headless human in its imagery, it has attracted a lot of speculation and several theories about its meaning and significance. In this video, we'll focus on the theory that the pillar has astronomical meaning, and specifically that it is a date stamp that refers to a major cataclysm, possibly a comet's airburst, at the beginning of the Younger Dryas climate event. Does the pillar record this event? I'm an archaeologist at University of Toronto who specializes in the Neolithic period in the Near East. Although I've written a couple of things about Gobekli Tepe, I'm not involved in the excavations there, and I come at this topic from the perspective of someone who's used to evaluating archaeological claims on the basis of evidence. I like to think that I have an open mind, but I also don't like to see people foisting claims upon the public that aren't founded on evidence. So, let's look at the claims about this pillar and the evidence for them. Does Pillar 43 actually record a global disaster, like a collision with a comet? In 2017, two engineers named Martin Swetman and Demetrius Tsikritsis offered the theory that Pillar 43 was a record of an astronomical event. This depends on two critical assumptions. First, that the creatures depicted on the pillar represent asterisms, or constellations. And second, that the ball balanced on the vulture's wing represents the sun. Swetman and Tsikritsis suggest that this combination is a, quote, date stamp unquote, that we can interpret by determining when the sun would have been in that position relative to the constellations at sunrise or sunset on one of four important dates in the astronomical year, the spring equinox, the summer solstice, the fall equinox, and the winter solstice. They suggest that these boxes with arches above them at the top of the pillar symbolize three of these sunrises or sunsets. As some of you may recall, in a different video, I offered a different interpretation of these features. Using astronomical software, they determined that the Sun would have been in exactly this position, near the arm of the Vulture constellation, which they identify with Sagittarius, during the summer solstice of about 10,950 BCE, within an error margin of about 250 years. Of course, the ancient people didn't have such software, so they'd have to determine the Sun's relationship to these constellations by observation. However, if they looked at the Sun in the daytime, they wouldn't be able to see the stars at all. About sunrise or sunset, they might be able to see the brightest stars in some of the constellations in its apparent vicinity, and I'm sure they'd be sufficiently familiar with the night sky that they'd also be able to infer the other ones that they couldn't see because they hadn't risen yet, or had already set. But why use such an awkward approach when it would have been a lot easier to take note of things like the apparent positions of planets or the moon relative to constellations that you can see at night? However, not everyone would agree that these animals even reference asterisms. How do Swetman and Sigritsis come to this conclusion? Well, first they rely on our modern Western conceptions of constellations that are rooted in ancient Greek ones that were conceived thousands of years after Gobekli Tepe's abandonment. They start with the rather obvious potential connection between the scorpion depicted on the pillar and Scorpius or Scorpio. If that connection is sound, it would mean that they should be looking for other constellations in Scorpio's vicinity. On this basis, they identify the vulture with Sagittarius, the crane-like bending bird to its right with Ophiuchus, and a goose-like bird at the bottom of the relief with Libra. They claim that, quote, these symbols are a reasonably good match with their corresponding asterisms, unquote. But are they? Even if these identifications are correct, are they placed in a way that allows confidence in that date stamp? Well, even Swetman and Zacritsis admit that the relative position of their alleged Ophiuchus, quote, is not very accurate, unquote. And they say, quote, we are unsure how to interpret the squat bird to the right of the scorpion, unquote. It's actually to lower right of the vulture or between the alleged Scorpio and Ophiuchus, and a point of fact, it doesn't match up with any star cluster. As we can see here, in fact, 
none of the animal icons are positioned very well to duplicate the positions or orientations of the constellations that Swetman and Sekritsis associate with them. No matter how we rotate this, we simply do not get any good fit to any of them, let alone their relative positions. Given how arbitrary asterisms are, this at the very least seems like cherry picking to fit their preconceptions. But Swetman and Sekritsis claim that they can show statistically that their identifications of asterisms are highly unlikely to be just by chance. They calculate the probability that any other permutations of animal symbols that could have been placed in these positions would be a, quote, better fit, unquote, than the fit they propose. They say, quote, given all the possible animal symbols that could have been carved on Pillar 43, how likely is it that the actual ones were chosen by pure chance, considering that they fit the asterisms for the date stamp better than almost any other combination, unquote. After carrying out this exercise, they conclude that, quote, the probability that Pillar 43 does not represent the date 10,950 BC is around 1 in 100 million, or 1 in 5 million if we neglect permutations with repeated symbols, unquote. Although they intend this to be a convincing statistical argument, it's not. At best, it relies on several unproven assumptions, including that the purpose of the pillar was to record the date 10,950 BCE. Notice their misleading wording here. Quote, the probability that pillar 43 does not represent the stated date, unquote. That's not what they're testing at all. They're only calculating the probability of getting a particular combination of animal symbols on the same pillar in a particular order. I found it difficult to follow their logic exactly, but it was something like this. The number of permutations of some items, like animal icons, taken in groups of a certain size is calculated as follows. Here, n represents the number of animal icons we have to choose from, and k is the number of animals that appear on the pillar. If, as Sweatman and Sekritsis do, we assume that they were choosing eight animals from 12 potential animals, then the result is as you see here. The combination of eight animals we see on this pillar is one possibility out of 19,958,400. That's not exactly what they did because they say they're not just using the number of permutations, but rather, quote, the number of permutations that are better than the existing configuration, unquote which they then divide by that 19 million odd number. However, they don't say how they decided what would be, quote, better, unquote. Specifically, they don't mention how they evaluated the goodness of fit of each animal to the proposed asterisms. The table they claim shows this seems to be nothing more than a subjective ranking of perceived fit, and they didn't account for rotation or include all the animal images that appear at this site, or for that matter, even all those that are on this very pillar. They not only ignore that inconvenient squatting bird, they also ignore the mostly obscured animal, perhaps a snake, that's above the one they identify as Lupus the wolf. And they do not consider the possibility that the headless man at lower right might also be an asterism. This statistical argument is completely specious. We also shouldn't forget that these animals don't just appear on pillar 43. Many of them are ubiquitous in Gobekli Tepe's imagery. If Swetman and Zekritsis are correct that at least some of those other images are also showing constellations, isn't it reasonable to expect that they should be arranged accordingly? Here's an example. This is Pillar 2 from Building A. It shows an aurochs, or wild bull, above a fox that is above a bending bird, perhaps again a crane. By Swetman and Zekritsis' logic, we might expect the aurochs to be Taurus and the bird to be Ophiuchus, but here they associate the crane with Pisces. Meanwhile, they say that Pillar 38 in Building D shows a wild boar between the aurochs and the crane. As you see here, it actually has the sequence of fox, wild boar, and three cranes. Swetman and Zekritsis ask, how is it possible for two different asterisms to be directly between the same pair, aurochs and crane? To account for this inconsistency, and aside from the aurochs-fox confusion, they suggest associating the bending bird with Pisces, the aurochs with Capricorn, and the fox and the boar with two portions of Aquarius. They ignore, or were unaware, 
that there are actually not one, but three cranes on the lower part of Pillar 38. However, these are not the only inconsistencies. Animal icons occur in all kinds of combinations at the site, and it's not uncommon for there to be multiple cranes together. Here's just one example on another pillar from Building D. And as for foxes, they often occur on two of the central pillars, one facing left, the other right. If the fox represented a constellation, wouldn't it always face the same way? Similarly, wild boar sometimes face left, elsewhere right. We even have one pillar from Building C where there are five birds, probably not cranes, above the wild boar, and a possible fox, dog, or wolf below that. There's no overall pattern that would be consistent with these animals representing asterisms, and Sweatman and Secritsis' argument would be a lot stronger if they could show convincingly that icons on multiple pillars were grouped and arranged in ways that fit asterisms. Some kinds of animals may tend to occur together, but not necessarily in the same order or the same number. Next, there's a claim that this set of images references the explosion of a comet in Earth's atmosphere. Whether there even was such a cometary event is hotly debated among scholars, but let's assume for the moment that there was. Well, where's the comet in this iconography? You'd think that, if the whole point of this pillar's image was to memorialize a cometary disaster, the artist would at least show a comet. Since there doesn't seem to be one, at least not on the surfaces of Pillar 43 that are visible, they turn to other pillars instead. While not trying to claim that the animal icons on those pillars have anything to do with date stamps, they point out some enigmatic symbols on the belts of the large anthropomorphic central pillars in Building D. The front of the belt, possibly a buckle, has a sort of U-shape surrounded by multiple symbols that resemble the letter H, while on the sides of the belt we find a large letter H framed by curves like parentheses. I think you'd agree that the H doesn't look at all like a comet or a star, but following Andrew Collins, Sweatman and Scritzis suggest that the U-shape and perhaps parentheses-like curves represent the bow shock wave of a comet entering the atmosphere although they suggest that the parentheses could also be the phases of the moon. Okay, is this reasonable evidence that any of this has to do with a comet or a comet's airburst? Here's what a bow shock wave looks like for a bullet traveling through air, and here for a blunt object. Speaking for myself, I don't see it as being very similar to what we see on these Gobekli Tepe belts. Sometimes a belt buckle is just a belt buckle. In any case, is it likely that prehistoric artists would depict the bow shock wave, assuming they could even see it, but not depict the comet itself? As we all know, one of the defining characteristics of a comet is its tail, and ancient artists of later periods sometimes showed comets as a bright or radiant circle with a tail extending away from it, as in this image of a coin of Mithridates VI, King of Pontus, around 110 BCE, or on this posthumous coin of Julius Caesar, struck around 19 BCE, that depicts a comet that appeared in the sky a few weeks after his assassination 25 years earlier. As far as I know, no one has ever identified anything on any Gobekli Tepe pillar, or for that matter on pillars at other Tash Tepeller sites, that looks like a star, let alone a star with a tail. All Sweatman and Tsukritsis can offer is that the many snakes shown at Gobekli Tepe might represent a meteor track. Given the way that snakes appear at the site, often with multiple parallel or overlapping snakes, and sometimes moving in opposite directions, that would have to be a very nasty meteor storm indeed. Next, we need to consider the idea that an artist living circa 9500 BCE would create a scene that depicts a glimpse of the sky as it would have appeared about a thousand years earlier. Or that they would have considered this a way to date a celestial event, rather than, for example, just counting the years. Or that they would care more about the exact date of such an important event than the event itself. After all, a comet exploding in the sky would be a pretty scary occasion. We could understand ancient people wanting to preserve the memory of such an occurrence for future generations. But really, would a picture of the night sky without a comma in it be the best way to do that?
And wouldn't it be easier to pass on a story about a big explosion in the sky than to pass on orally a description of what the sky looked like at sunrise on the day that the explosion took place? I don't think there's any evidentiary way to answer this question, but common sense would incline me towards focusing on memory of the disaster itself, not its date. You do have to give credit to Swetman and Sekritsis for offering an imaginative interpretation of Pillar 43. And it's easy to understand why a lot of people find their theory intriguing. But when you look at it in detail, it's really not very convincing. Ancient people depicted animals in their art for all kinds of reasons, probably including references to hunting and possibly as totems or as icons for social groups, much as we today often use animal icons for sports teams. I'm sure Neolithic people were also very familiar with the night sky, and it's possible that they named some major asterisms after animals, though probably not the same asterisms that modern cultures identify. But we currently have no independent evidence that Neolithic people in Southwest Asia ever drew pictures of the sky. If that was what they were doing at Gobekli Tepe, it would certainly be very interesting. But it seems far more likely that the imagery at the site had a very different purpose than astronomy, let alone recording a remote date. Thank you and stay safe.